This tutorial will review principles of water quality, including important monitoring parameters, filtration, and potential medical problems related to poor water quality. The material in this presentation is applicable to all amphibians and is suitable for anyone interested in working with amphibians. As discussed in other modules, amphibians have highly permeable skin. This feature means that solutes that are in the water surrounding the amphibian are likely to also be found within the animal. So when discussing water quality parameters, amphibians can be thought of as fish. In other words, the same attention to detail and excellent water quality that is required to keep fish healthy is also required for amphibians. Solutes and other water quality parameters that are important to measure and control include oxygen, carbon dioxide, pH, hardness, alkalinity, and nitrogen in its various forms. These parameters can change depending on the underlying properties of the water and are affected by a number of variables, including the original source of the water, which may affect the basic chemical components or contain infectious diseases such as chytrid fungus, the delivery of the water as some municipalities put additives in the water or toxins may leach from the piping, the handling of the water can change the gas concentration, pH, and temperature. And then the animals themselves can change the composition of the water. The amount of dissolved oxygen is particularly important for tadpoles and for the health of any aquatic plants in the enclosure. Oxygen can be added to the water using an air stone or by incorporating some type of waterfall or flow that mixes the water with air as it is entering the tank. Excess dissolved gases, including oxygen, however, can be a problem for aquatic animals and may lead to formation of gas bubbles within the tissues of the animal. This condition most often occurs either when using deep well water as a source, which often is under pressure and has a higher amount of dissolved gases than is found in surface water, or there is an air leak in the filtration system that is pumping air into the water and then returning it to the tank. Fortunately, the problem can be easily corrected by allowing the water to agitate or aerate prior to returning it to the tank, such as using a waterfall. Carbon dioxide is the other important dissolved gas that can affect amphibians. The gas is produced as a metabolic waste. The compound is acidic, so as it accumulates in the water, the pH decreases. Proper aeration of the water helps keep the CO2 levels down. In tanks where water flow is low or aeration is poor, it is also important to keep the bioload appropriate to the size of the tank. Too many animals in too small a tank can lead to increased CO2 and an acidic environment. The pH in systems that remain closed will drop over time from decomposition of organic matter and carbon dioxide production as we just discussed. This drift can be prevented by cleaning the mechanical filter and performing water changes regularly, by having good aeration and circulation of the water, and by including some type of buffering capacity such as calcium carbonate in the water. Hardness refers to the amount of various mineral salts in the water, the most prevalent of which are calcium, magnesium, iron, and aluminum. The more salts in the water, the harder it is. The name comes from water's ability to make a soapy lather. The more minerals in the water, the harder it is to make a lather. Most amphibians prefer soft water, but this can vary by species. To harden the water, add calcium or magnesium salts. To soften it, add distilled reverse osmosis or deionized water. But do not use commercial water softeners. Alkalinity refers to the buffering capacity of the water and is determined by the amount of carbonate and bicarbonate present. In general, because it has lower amounts of mineral salts, soft water has less buffering capacity. The buffering capacity is important in minimizing changes in pH and can be increased by adding crushed coral or other sources of bicarbonate. Nitrogen is one of the most important solutes to monitor in living systems. It is generally produced as a byproduct of animal metabolism or decomposition as ammonia. 
bacteria present in the tank or filter will convert the ammonia to nitrite. And then different bacteria will convert the nitrite to nitrate. These bacteria are free living and will colonize the water and filter but may not be present in a new tank. The nitrate will then build up in the system until the water is changed or may be used by live aquatic plants. Of these three, ammonia is most toxic to amphibians, followed by nitrite and then nitrate. Additionally, the pH of the water can affect the toxicity of any unconverted ammonia. In more acidic water, the more ammonia is converted to ammonium, which is less toxic. So it is important to know the amount of ammonia present in the water before attempting to adjust the pH, as correcting a low pH too fast may result in toxicity to the animals with the same level of ammonia present in the system. Ammonia toxicity can present as lethargy, dyspnea, color change, increased mucus production, neurologic signs, and a possible change in posture in animals not fully submerged. Any measurable ammonia in the water is toxic. Nitrite toxicity causes methemoglobinemia, which is manifested as respiratory distress. Nitrites should be less than 1.5 mg per liter. Nitrate is the least toxic and can be removed with regular water changes. It should be less than 10 mg per liter. Given the severe consequences of nitrogen toxicity, it is important to establish the bacteria in the water system that can convert the toxic forms down to the least toxic nitrates before amphibians are placed into the water. One method to cycle a tank is to add hardy animals to the tank to provide an ammonia source and transfer gravel or filter material from another system to the new system. This method may take three to six weeks to get the bacteria firmly established and may risk transferring pathogens from one tank to the next. An alternative method is to add ammonia to the tank as outlined below until the nitrites measure zero. Animals can then be added to the tank and no further ammonia is needed. This method should take approximately two weeks. There are various methods to test for the parameters we have been discussing. The colorimetric methods are popular as they are simple, inexpensive, and effective, though they do take some time to perform. There are various meters to measure dissolved gases and pH. These are expensive but very rapid and accurate. Samples may be sent to a commercial lab. And there are strip test kits available, but these tend to be inaccurate and should be avoided when possible. As mentioned in the introduction, the source of the incoming water should be taken into consideration as different sources may be prone to having different properties. The quality and parameters of municipal water sources can vary widely. Most importantly, this type of water may have additives such as chlorine that will need to be addressed prior to its use. Rainwater can be a good clean source. It tends to be soft and so minerals may need to be added if problems are seen in the amphibians, particularly in tadpoles. The pH should be measured prior to use as well, as many areas have acidic rain. Biosecurity is important as rainwater collection systems may attract local free-ranging amphibians, so these systems should be enclosed in such a way to deter wildlife access to the water. Well water may be used and is also a good choice as there are no added disinfectants. This type of water tends to have a low oxygen content but may be supersaturated with other gases so it should always be aerated prior to use. This type also tends to be hard and depending on the source may have high amounts of iron, salt, or pollution that should be taken into consideration. Bottled water is available but it is expensive and the quality will vary widely. If choosing to use this source, you should test this water just as extensively as water from any other source. Some of the most important contaminants of incoming water are listed here. Chlorine and chloramines are often added to municipal water supplies as disinfectants. The chlorine can be blown off by aerating the water or allowing for evaporation. Non-aerated water should be allowed to sit for more than 24 hours prior to use. 
Chloramines, however, will not evaporate and need to be removed using filtration. Phosphates may also be added in some towns to bind any lead that may be present in the water. Unfortunately, they will also bind other metals such as calcium and may lead to signs consistent with low calcium such as tetany and developmental abnormalities. If there is significant amount of phosphate in the incoming water, it can be filtered using arsenic filters, though this type of media can be a bit expensive to maintain. Heavy metals may be added as water is passed through the plumbing, such as copper pipes. Another source may be metal screen tops. If water is dripped or misted through these screens into the enclosure, it may leach heavy metals from the screens and carry them to the amphibians. You can avoid this complication by using plastic screening or by not allowing water to flow through the screens. So as we have discussed, depending upon the source of the water and its parameters, the incoming water may need to be treated prior to using it for amphibians. Aeration, charcoal, and arsenic filters have already been mentioned. Another treatment process is reverse osmosis. This process uses a semi-permeable membrane and pressure to remove solutes from the water. The system is somewhat expensive and requires maintenance, but produces very clean water. In fact, for some animals, this water may be too pure and some solutes may need to be added back to the water. It should be noted that reverse osmosis water, whilst very pure, is not distilled water. Distilled water should not be used with amphibians. If the water is too pure and has many fewer solutes than are present in the amphibians, as represented here by the X's, there is osmotic pressure for water to enter the animal. This shift in water can cause swelling and edema formation in the animal and result in serious medical problems. So once you have acquired and treated your water source, there are two main approaches to maintaining good water quality in amphibian enclosures. The water can be changed regularly by completely dumping and refilling the containers, by removing and replacing a percentage of the water, or by allowing fresh water to flow through the system at all times. Filtration can also keep the water clean and is most often used for all aquatic animals when large volumes are in use or in situations where you need water movement. Complete and partial water changes can remove phosphates and nitrogen metabolism products such as ammonia, nitrites, and nitrates. Fresh water may replenish nutrients for any plants in the enclosure as well. The frequency and amount of water changes required will vary with each system and may be based on the number and size of the animals and the volume of water. For example, a large tank with a lot of water and few animals will need less frequent changes than a small one with many animals. How the animals are fed will impact the need, so if animals are broadcast fed in the water, more frequent changes will be needed compared to if they are fed out of the water. And even systems with filters will need water changes to remove built-up nitrates and other compounds, though the frequency will need to be much less than in systems without filters. There are three types or components to a complete filtration system. The first is mechanical filters. These will trap larger particles of debris and waste. Note that they only trap the particles and keep them from returning to the tank. They will still be present in the filter and may affect water quality parameters if the filters are not cleaned regularly. The second is chemical filtration. These filters most commonly use activated charcoal as a substrate which will bind many different impurities. These filters may also act as an ion exchange and soften the water. Here you can see an example of both a mechanical and chemical filtration setup. This system also sterilizes the water with ozone prior to use with amphibians. Biological filters are essentially the bacteria that convert nitrogen waste products as discussed earlier in this module. These bacteria can be given their own section of an external filter or pump system, but will also grow within the tank on any surface. The more surface area provided for the bacteria, the larger bio load they will be able to accommodate. Remember to cycle a new tank prior to adding important animals as we have previously discussed. Also note that this component of the filtration system is most sensitive to changes in the water, 
So if you are treating animals by adding antibiotics to the water, you will likely also kill off the biological filter and may then see problems associated with high ammonia in the tank. Here are some important key points to remember. Start with the best water available. Water should be kept fresh and clean by water changes and filtration. The mechanical filters must frequently be changed and remember that the biological filter is a living organism. Be sure to keep your bio load appropriate for the system and when possible using live plants can help keep parameters in balance. Some additional references on maintaining good water quality are listed here. Thank you for your time and attention and good luck with your future amphibian projects.